away from my new book of poetry about liberty. And what I'll read today is called The Lost Sheep. It's an alternate version of a fairly well-known story from the New Testament of the Bible. Whereas the Bible gives the shepherd's version, my book gives the sheep's version. So here it is, The Lost Sheep. The shepherd, upon noticing a sheep was missing from his flock, left the others behind to search for the one who had strayed, roaming far and wide, even climbing a great oak for a better look across the valley. But to no avail, the sheep was nowhere to be spied. The shepherd was relentless, beating the bushes with his hand-me-down crozier, going twice around each good-sized rock, three times around the old watering hole. At dusk, he gave up. But just for that day, he would resume his search at dawn. Meanwhile, the sheep had never stopped running till he reached the forest beyond the valley, where he rested briefly in the shelter of a juniper, tingling both from its needles and its nerves, then was off again. Upon exiting the forest, he came to the river, somehow or other attained the far side, Whereupon gazing at the birds in the endless sky, he too felt the joy of flying, merely from being free. Henceforth, his mutton would know no stew, <laughs> and his creamy wool would gently mature into stately gray, and his great escape would, in the end, serve as the title of his memoirs. <laughs> Thank you very much. The Fence Such a big job to keep people away, and where did the FedEx guy go, I wanted to ask her as she drove the truck, as he drove the truck away with the lawnmower part and Holland bulbs. The ones she last year dug up and threw into the air with such glee, the squirrels came down a branch just to witness. I call her in and she gives me the, a look I ignore, her defiant stare, one eye toward the road, alert to bark after Alpine who bit her once, or Lori for no reason, for no one really opens the gate, but she's gone irrational, out of her head about rapists, drug dealers, job stealers, and crime. Even as I point out how Manny gets out of his mail truck to throw the ball, or the divorced UPS man brings milk bones and sad stories, or the student I nominated as commencement speaker for her work on the DREAM Act and the way she put herself through school all A's while supporting her family. And I'm embarrassed and angry at this line of barking, even blame myself for putting in the territorial blockade that makes her growl and show her, te show her teeth. I was only trying to spare myself midwinter late night walks, a mistake that only provoked the dog to spew America first, while Becky, the spaniel up the street who has no fence, welcomes everyone. <clears throat> There's a little background to this. Uh, about 30 years ago, my wife and I moved to a um, very rural, poor, essentially dying community in uh, upstate New York and at the Conic Mountains, which is really the northern kind of fringe of Appalachia. 
but happily, I met some wonderful people there, and uh, one of them was the owner of a general store, which was, which had done very well in its heyday, but was doing worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and like the rest of the town, was was basically dying. Um, the speaker in this uh, poem, which is as much oral history as it is poetry, the speaker in this is the owner of the general store. And the title is The End of the General Store. We were a general store, groceries, meat, hardware, appliances, sewing supplies, occasional cards, newspapers, whatever people needed. If we didn't have it, we'd get it. We had two butchers full time, plus four others, Dad and me. We never sold beer or lottery tickets. Dad didn't believe in it. We had 62 farms in town then. That's 62 farmers' wives who shopped here. Those were women who cooked, not like today when they stick a box in the microwave, call it dinner. They had big families, too. There'd be three or four generations under one roof, maybe a serving girl to help the missus, and a hired hand. They had to eat, too. Some women were feeding a dozen folks three times a day. That was a lot of groceries. Then you had 62 farmers who always needed hardware, parts for their machinery. We carried it all, springs, belts, plugs, oils, tools, all manner of screw, hasp and bolt, hoses and pipes. Those days we'd open at eight, go, go, go all day till six o'clock, and you couldn't believe where the day went. When we were closed, if someone needed a thing, they'd call up to the house, and I'd meet them at the store, late at night or even on a Sunday after church. It was the way business was done. We knew these people. We grew up together. If someone needed something, you wanted to provide it. It was nothing special. It was normal in a town like this to take care of your own. We went like that right up till the late 60s. Then the farm started going. One by one, they sold out. Until now, there's not one dairy farm left in town. There were still people around. We had loyal customers who shopped here for years. Then GE shut down. That was the early 80s. That hurt. There must have been 150 men working for GE in Pittsfield who lived on this side of the mountain. That meant 150 paychecks come over the mountain every Friday. But when they had the layoffs, that was pretty much the end of it. We opened in 1927, had a good business for 60 years. These last 20 years, each one's been worse than the one before. Towns become a ghost town. If I saw a, good t if I saw a dozen customers, it was a good day. We closed this past fall. We had to. We didn't even make enough to pay for oil to eat the store in winter. I hated to do it, but the money wasn't there. Dad started this store. I've been working here since I was a boy, running it since Dad died in 1966. That's all I've ever done, all I've ever known. I'm 81, and to tell the truth, I wanted to die before we closed the store. I know nothing is forever, but I never wanted to see this. I felt it, I owed it to Dad to keep it open. A son doesn't want to disappoint his father, no matter how old he is. A man can live too long. That's something you never expected me to say. I never expected to say it myself, but I'm saying it. So I'm not a uh, scholar of Greek mythology, but my understanding is uh, among the primordial gods, the first was chaos. And 
he, he uh, fathered Erebus, the uh, god of darkness, kind of a Hades-like character. Sometimes he's not really embodied. Sometimes he's the gateway to the darkness. At any rate, I thought that in reading the front pages of the news this week, this would be a good place to start a song. <laughs> and maybe you can sing it with me. With Erebus rejoicing the triumph of the dark, he rose to shoot from ambush at the true of heart. Ignorance his arrows, hatefulness his bows, to forge the spears of chaos with every hammer throw. To forge the spears of chaos with every hammer throw. You got it. I too have felt his arrow deep within my chest Pierced through my spirit, all hope drained from my breast In doubt and in confusion, I turn to face the fight Tempted to surrender to an endless night I was tempted to surrender to an endless night Now I have heard the stories, the fables, and the myths that justify the evil in this world in which we live. They tell them loud and often till lies become their truth, but they'll be undisguised when their lies come home to roost. Sing. They'll be undisguised when their lies come home to roost. I put my faith in goodness, I put my faith in light, and in that faith empower the strength to make it right. I'll not give in to hatred, to failure or despair, for there is nothing broken that love cannot repair. There is nothing broken that love cannot repair. You believe it? To all who are disheartened, discouraged, or confused, mistreated or oppressed, discarded or abused, the moral arc is long and to justice it will bend, but let it be recorded that we bent it with our hands. Let it be recorded we bent it with our hands. The moral arc is long, and to justice it will bend. Let it be recorded, we bent it with our hands. Good singing. This is a poem by Aaron Hansen, entitled Life. Life can be the sunshine on peaceful days with bright blue skies. Or life can be the raindrops that fall like tears squeezed from your eyes. Life can be the heaven that on you'll only reach through hell since you won't know you're happy if you've never been sad as well. Life can teach hard lessons, but you'll be wiser once you know that even roses need both sunshine and a touch of rain to grow. Thank you very much. Here's a Tom Russell song. Uh, he wrote it about 13 years ago, but it's uh, still apropos. I got 800 miles of open border 
right outside my door. Those minute men and little pickup trucks who declare their own damn war. Well, the government wants to build a barrier like old Berlin, 12 feet tall. But if Uncle Sam sends the illegals home, who's gonna build the wall? Who's gonna build your wall, boys? Who's gonna mow your lawn? Who's gonna cook your Mexican food when your Mexican maid is gone? Who's gonna wax the floor tonight down at the local mall? Who's gonna wash your baby's face? Who's gonna build your wall? Now I ain't got no politics, so don't lay that rap on me. Left wing, right wing, up wing, down wing, I see strip malls from sea to shine and sea. It's the fat cat white developer who's created this whole damn squall. It's a pyramid scheme of dirty jobs. Now who's gonna build the wall? Who's gonna build the wall, boys? Who's gonna mow your lawn? Who's gonna cook your Mexican food when your Mexican maid is gone? Who's gonna wax the floors tonight down at the local mall? Who's gonna wash your baby's face? Who's gonna build your wall? As fundamentalist Muslims, fundamentalist Jews, as fundamentalist Christians, they'll blow the whole thing up for you. Now as I travel around this big old world, there's one thing I most fear. It's a white man with a cell phone and a golf shirt in his rear. I screwed that up, but you got the point. Who's gonna mow you long? Who's gonna cook your Mexican food when your Mexican maid is gone? Who's gonna wax the floors tonight down at the local mall? Who's gonna wash your baby's face? Who's gonna build your wall? Yeah, who's gonna wash your baby's face? Who's gonna build your wall? Oh, apologies to Tom Russell. <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking how strange it is that they, so much of the hate in the outside world is engendering all this love that's so present in the room. It's here. And um, so I discovered, um, well, I'd like to read one of the strangest love poems I've ever encountered. I just discovered this Italian poet called Enzo Lamartora. He's just been published for the first time in English, um, translated by Michael Palma. It came out in December. And I will read this one poem of his, translated by Michael Palma. When he came down from the border crossings, he was always shattered, shattered and exhausted. He'd lost something of himself each time. He was a smuggler, like many, after all, in that wretched time, amid the stony and frozen regions of the crest. A particular smuggler, though, concerned not with salt, currency, or tobacco, but with handwritten letters love letters. It might happen that because of laziness, too great a distance, lack of means, or even the reluctance of the beloved, a lover was unable to deliver his love, the intensity of his love. Then the smuggler appointed himself as a go-between. 
He went to the lover's house and spent three days and three nights closeted with him, talking with him, lying with him, weeping together with him, as a way of totally identifying with his suffering and taking on the burden of his passion, his desperation and desire. Then, once across the pass, with his pack on his back, he was welcomed into the house of the beloved recipient, cajoling him, perhaps, or pretending, or mimicking, because, as we know, love passes through doors more easily when unannounced. And once accepted, he would repeat the action of transference, of delivery, in the opposite direction. Courier and beloved lay in bed for three days and three nights so that love would have a way of passing from body to body, from soul to soul. And this was the occupation carried out in secret, making sure that love arrived from one who felt it to one who didn't have it, or had never seen it, or had lost it for a long time. And often that transference that weary road and that delivery drained him. They changed him forever. When he returned to himself, he didn't know who he was, the lover, the beloved, or the messenger, because he had lived the love deeply, but he'd torn it from himself out of duty to give it away, to make someone else come alive. Thank you. Happy to see all of you again so much. I was in that beautiful Delray Beach and it for the month of January and luckily to be staying in an, something called an Airbnb for the month. Um, what I would just like to share is the woman who owned the Airbnb was not there. She was nearby taking care of her body where she had had a stroke months before and her children rented out her cottage to us. I call it, first I'll tell you her name was Joy, J-O-I-E, and her picture was there. She looked like Joy. I felt her joy when we were in her little cottage. I tried to make a poem about her, so this is it in process woman's tropical paradise. Ours was an air bed and breakfast home, a space where one unexpected black cat protected behind, pr protected behind lush palm foliage to avoid nearby traffic, dangerous predators like lizards returned to seek a meal we learned that our unseen householder had even provided feline non-reproductive options while tending her tropical garden beauty. She painted Disney characters with playful abandon on guest room walls, a joy for grandchildren and guests. Art and delight was there before cat feeding routine changed to one of hoping for the next dinner. Our host must now learn about new activities of daily living and waiting for family visits. We learn in another stage of living. I just want her to come through. Thank you. Thank you. This is a song I wrote several years ago, but I never played out. But a couple of people who'd heard it liked it a lot. And so I entered it in the, the lyrics contest that American Songwriter Magazine runs. And I learned recently that it, it won an honorable mention in the upcoming issue. Thank you. Used to watch the sky at night and marvel how a photon's flight.
across a million billion miles should chance to meet our eye. Count countless stars above, count on years of endless love, knew that like that starry sky, love would never die. It's not what I don't know that haunts me. what I thought I knew, what I thought I knew, I'd see you at the breakfast table, leafing through the morning paper, barely time to kiss her cheek, headed out the door. Countless nights and working weekends, disappointments, failed amends. As those times and signs went by, I knew love could never die. It's not what I don't know that haunts me. It's what I thought I knew. What I thought I knew Well, I don't know How I had it wrong Or how to make it right Don't know where our story's gone Or where she is tonight It's not what I don't know What I thought I knew What I thought I knew What I thought I knew